people have finally realized in the last 10 years or so that um, spatial intelligence is particularly important for performance in the so-called STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I think that both in the US and in Australia, where we, we look at the future of work and what, you know, what sort of skills we need people to have, and um, it's clear that we need more people in the STEM workforce, so we're trying to find ways of you know, preparing um, students um, to be in that, to, to work in that, in that workforce. And, and sort of the reason I think this has sort of become a big, you know, a big idea in the last 10 years, it really started with a, a National Research Council report in the US called Learning to Think Spatially, which really made the point that, you know, spatial reasoning or spatial thinking is important in STEM, but is not really fostered very well in our educational system. And, and then drawing on that, um, there was a very large grant um, uh, sort of multi-university grant in the United States that's pretty much been going for the last, I don't know, six or seven years, that has really, um, you know, sort of, you know, made, popularized this idea and really um, gotten a, a lot more people involved in this question of how to, uh, of, of uh, spatial thinking and how to, how to improve spatial thinking. So, oops. So, um, and a starting point for a lot of this research when we, you know, when this was, is, what we know about sort of measures of spatial ability. You may, I'm going to talk about more about these in a minute, but you may recognize these from things you do, you've done in aptitude tests, et cetera. Um, and it turns out that these abilities predict performance in a lot of different um, STEM or, or science disciplines. Um, in medicine, they predict performance in anatomy classes, um, things like imagining cross sections of anatomy in chemistry, people's ability to mentally manipulate molecules and think about what, how they're going to react, use diagrams, understand diagrams, etc. In geosciences, um, things like inferring, um, you know, the internal structure, what sort of, you know, you, when a geologist is, sees, you know, outcrops, they see sort of ways in which rocks are coming out of the earth and they have to infer what's, what's going on underneath, right? And so that, again, um, geo students um, in geology really struggle with that if they don't have um, good spatial abilities, and in physics. So these are some of the examples. I, I'm purposely not saying a lot about math because I know you're going to hear a lot about math from Tom tomorrow. Um, so, all, so, and so these are all sort of individual studies, and it's important when you look at these studies, um, you know, to, to sort of to interpret them critically. So it's important to think about, well, how many people are in this study? And I mean, if it's a small sample, maybe you don't want, you don't want to you know, you want to replicate that and get more evidence for it. Or, and, and one of the things that you always have to think about is, okay, spatial ability is, predict, is predicting this performance in this um, science classroom, but, you know, spatial ability is also um, correlated with general intelligence. So maybe what we're really picking up on here is actually, a, you know, a contribution of general intelligence, not spatial specifically. So it's important to do studies that also control for these things like math and verbal ability that we might consider to be part of general intelligence. And a study that I think is really convincing um, that does all of these things is um, a study, um, well, it was a large, um, a large study done in the US which was, you know, spun off with many publications. And it was a study in which they, ba they basically, um, uh, the Project Talent um, project, they um, tested uh, 400,000 randomly sampled students at age 13. This was about 20, 30 years ago, 30 years ago at least. Um, and, um, and they've now followed those students through to see you know, where, how did they do in school? Where did they go to university? Did they go to university? What careers have they ended up in? So this is an enormous sample. So, you know, we, we know that what we get, we're getting out of this is solid. And, um, uh, and, and the other thing they did was they also tested their ability in, sci in math and verbal at the same time so that we can sort of control out any variance that's due to math and verbal. And what these studies have shown is that even after controlling for how the students' mathematics and verbal ability at age 13, um, the um, spatial ability over and above those things predict things like who got degrees in math and science, um, you know, they're more predictive of higher achievements, who's in a scientific career now, and uh, uh, who's pursued a scientific um, occupation, and also things like um, creative work. How, how many publications did people have if they, if they um, did pursue a science? So I think this is a pretty convincing study that, um, uh, 
you know, some, that's something about somebody's spatial ability when they're age 13 actually predicts, you know, whether they're going to be successful in science later. So, um, and as I said, there have been many studies, many um, publications from the study, and they're still coming out. Um, we also have um, good evidence now that spatial skills can be trained. Um, so uh, again, there were lots of individual small studies that people had done showing that I, give, I, I, I have people play a spatial video game and they get better at some spatial task. Or I train them, I have them give them practice at doing mental rotation or something like that, and they get better at a spatial task. And you know, again, you don't want to put too much credence into one individual study, but this is a paper that came out a few couple of years ago now it's a, a, what's called a meta-analysis where they, they basically looked across, again, hundreds of studies that have looked at, um, a, a, at training effects and spatial ability and found that, um, that it, indeed, there is good evidence that if, even when you, when you look across all the studies and look at how big of an effect, how big, big of a change they got in all the studies, there is very solid evidence that um, some sort of training in spatial thinking improves your performance on spatial ability tests. And the average effect size is about 0.47, which means about half of a standard deviation um, is, the, is the average improvement. Um, it, it also, there is some evidence that this, these training effects, they, they don't, you know, they, they last over time. They transfer to some other spatial tasks. However, I should say that there's little evidence to date that um, that's, um, training that just focuses on spatial skills, like something which you'll, like as shown in those spatial ability tests that we'll talk about more, that it actually transfers to things like um, that just training somebody on spatial ability necessarily makes them better at some sort of science domain. There's very little evidence of that for, to, to date. So, um, so given that then, um, the sort of general outline of my talk is first to talk about what is spatial thinking. Second, you know, how do we think spatial? What's spatial thinking like? And how can we educate people to, sp to think spatially? So first of all, what's spatial thinking? So um, as I say, it's tempting to say spatial thinking, and I think a lot of psychologists on a, in, in my field these days, um, they say, say, oh, spatial thinking is what spatial ability tests measure, right? And so let's look at these spatial ability tests a little bit more. So. Um, uh, this first test is what's called the paper folding test, and what you have to do is imagine a piece of paper being folded, a hole is punched in it, and then the paper is unfolded, and you have to say which pattern would, exist, would, would, would occur if, um, if, if you unfolded the pattern. So what's the right answer there? This is C, right? Should be C. And that's a, that's a very easy item. Um, and, and those of, people have used this test and they know it gets much harder than that. I keep forgetting to put a harder item up here. Um, the next one is you see two cubes. Um, each one, there's three items in this test. In each case, you see two cubes and you have to, the assumption is that there's a different letter on each side of the cube and then you have to say whether the two cubes are, could be the same or the different. So the two on the, on, so could, um, the, the first one, the answer is no, because um, the X would, you know, there's only one X on the thing, so the X, as you see, is above the A and the B on one case, and it's below the A and the B, right, on the other case, um, and, and, it's, and so on. So you have to basically imagine these two cubes and say, could I rotate this one to be this other cube? And, you know, could it be the same thing? And then the third one is the famous mental rotation task, um, which we'll talk about more, um, which is a task where you see an object um, a picture of an object, and you have to say which of these four pictures on the right could be the same object rotated in space, and which is a different object. And when it's a different, yeah, and, um, and I don't know the answer to that. I'm not, can't do this one online. <laughs> um, but, and, and two of the four are the same object, okay? So those are examples of, of tests of spatial ability. Um, so, so a couple of things that cognitive psychologists have, have and, and educational psychologists have looked at with spatial ability. One is, you know, how, what spatial abilities are there? Are there subsets of spatial abilities, okay? And the way they do that is they put them all into a big, they, they give people a whole bunch of tests, and then they look at the correlations between them, and they find sort of what they're, they're called factors, but they're kind of clusters of tests that correlate together, and that suggests, oh, that's a type of ability. And then there's another cluster over here that doesn't correlate so well with this one, but it, it, the, the tests of that correlate with each other. 
And so, um, so that's one thing. Another thing you might know about spatial ability, because it's sort of in the popular culture, is that there are sex differences in some spatial abilities, right? So I'm going to um, just talk a little bit about the some of the different subtypes of spatial ability and then whether there are sex differences in those spatial abilities. So the sort of the most dominant, you know, factor or subclassification sub of spatial ability that's been studied is what's called spatial visualization which is defined as things like the ability to mentally manipulate, rotate, twist, or invert objects without any reference to oneself. That's a quote I got from somebody. Usually it involves, you, see, you see an object and you have to imagine a series of transformations of that object and then see what would result. And so, you know, the paper folding test, the cube comparisons, and this is sort of like a sort of a little mental jigsaw puzzle where you have to figure out which of these objects could fit into the shape above and how you would rotate them, et cetera, to do that. So this is, this is what's called spatial visualization. This is probably, tests of spatial visualization are probably the ones that are you know, mo mo most used in studies that correlate spatial ability with some sort of science or math outcome. And interesting, there's no reliable sex differences in these, in these tests, okay? Um, so um, it's, and there be, again, these meta-analysis have been done where they look at how, what's the difference between men and women across hundreds of studies and they don't get it, there is no reliable sex difference here. It's, you know, maybe sometimes men to tend to be a little better, but it's not reliable. Then these are other sort of types of spatial ability that have been identified. Um, the first one is called speeded rotation or spatial relations. Um, so this is a test where you have to, you do have to imagine something rotating and say whether this other object could be the same object rotated. And, and, what's, and you have to do it as quickly as possible. There's a time limit and you have to do it as quickly as possible. This has a large sex difference. So men tend to be about a standard, almost a standard deviation better than women at this type of task. Um, then there are these other tasks. Um, one co is called, clo I mean, called closure speed and flexibility of closure. These are sort of about seeing some spatial figure in a sort of a background. So on the left, it's just what's called the snowy pictures test. You're supposed to, can you see what's it, what that picture is showing? Can anyone see what that is? It's an anchor. Yeah, it's showing an anchor, but in a very snowy background. This one over here is, is a type of test that's from a, a factor called flexibility of closure. And it's about, you see these objects at the top and you have to find them in the object on the bottom and you have to sort of outline them. And then perceptual speed, which is uh, you see an object and it's just, it's really all about speed. You have to mark the one that's the same as that object as fast as possible. So these are, um, and then basically um, you do get sort of medium sized sex differences in these sort of other tests here. So that's one thing, you know, so, so you know, so psychologists when they, they have done a lot of work on these spatial ability measures. but. Um, you know, and so I think, it, and I, I think we should be looking at these measures because they do. Cor these are the sorts of things that correlate with performance. So you know, but but there's, I think there's a number of reasons why, in look, thinking about spatial thinking and how we want to train it and what it is, we shouldn't just focus on these tests. Okay, so one thing is that these tests, the development of these tests was not theoretically motivated. Um, basically, a lot of these tests were developed a lot during World War II. To, by the army um, to, um, or the, the, the military to sort of, to, they, you know, they're getting all these recruits into the army and they wanted to put them in the right jobs, right? And they wanted to know who was going to be a good mechanic, who was going to be a good pilot, and, you know, who would be better off being a cook or something or, you know, whatever. And, um, and so they were trying to identify the people that would be good at things like mechanical and, you know, mechanical reasoning, fly, flying planes, etc. And th some of these spatial ability tests, indeed, predicted that, so you know, that's how those tests became developed and became part of, of the culture and cognitive psychology. But, um, but you know, they weren't really, I mean, unlike say, you know, the original intelligence tests, which was developed really for educational purposes, you know, they weren't really, the, the, nobody really sat back and said, okay, let's think about what spatial thinking is and, and make lots of tests to measure all the different aspects of spatial thinking. These were just tests that, you know, they worked because they predicted things and then they become, became part of the, you know, the, the list of tests available to cognitive psychologists and then they did all this factor analysis and stuff with them later. So I sort of feel, that, you know, that there was never really an attempt to say, well, let's step back and think what, what spatial thinking is and make you know, t and develop tests that measure all aspects of spatial thinking. Mm 
Um, another th reason I think that can ha that, um, you know, we shouldn't just look at this, you know, just because there are sex differences in, in some tests, and I mean, the, te the sex difference in the speed of rotation is very large, and in some aspects of spatial perception, but it sort of perceptuates, you know, it sort of perpetuates the idea that, you know, oh, well, women can't succeed in STEM because they're low spatial. And in fact, even when there are sex differences, um, you know, they always, it's always overlapping distributions, and there are always women that are just as good as the best men, and men that are just as bad as the best women. So, you know, you certainly can't assume that because somebody is a man or a woman that they're going to have higher low spatial ability, right? Um, and I mean, I think, um, you know, so th I don't think they necessarily cover, you know, because of how they were developed, they don't really necessarily cover all aspects of spatial thinking. And so, um, so a question that I've been asked, I've asked in my research really over my career is, well, how do re people really think about space in everyday life and in STEM? And, you know, in what senses are these tests helpful to us? In what sense are they limited, right? So um, these are some examples of um, domains that, um, that, uh, you know, that, that I've looked at at various aspect times in my career. First of all, I've looked at everyday navigation, which I was terrible at this morning because <laughs> I thought I knew, I knew where this was, but I didn't pay attention to Danielle's map and I didn't know how to drive to it. <laughs> so um, so I, I knew, you know, which is interest, interesting. I knew, the, I knew the location, but not the route. Uh, mechanical reasoning, reason, you know, imagining how machines work. Uh, meteorology, I've done some work in the past on uh, understanding weather maps, etc. Um, biology, learning anatomy and imagining, sort of interpreting cross sections of anatomy. Haven't really done much on geology, one little study, but um, other people have done a lot of work on, on geology. And chemistry, um, done a lot of my recent work has been in collaboration with uh, an organic chemist, because I think chemistry is a really interesting um, domain in which to look at spatial reasoning. Um, and so what do I think is, you know, so I think we should think very broadly about what spatial thinking is. And, um, and uh, so I, I would say, well, it's sort of made up of two main things. One is thinking about space or reasoning or solving problems about space. And, um, but also using space to think. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. And, and then within those, I think there's sort of different, um, subtypes of spatial ability. So um, in terms of thinking about space, I think there's, you know, we think about space, as I say, at the scale of environment. So navigating to this building today, that's thinking about space at the scale of, envir of the environments. Usually you're thinking about yourself being, moving around in a larger space. The scale of objects is what we're doing when we're imagining paper folding and uh, things like that. You're thinking about, okay, how can I manipulate objects, right? And um, and then using space to think is where you take something that maybe is not inherently spatial, but by representing it in a spatial way, you can get some insight into it. And I think we do this a lot when we're um, using graphs or analyzing data, at least I do. Um, so let's go into these a little bit more. Um, so at the scale of environments, um, so um, this, this was referred to in this National Research Council report as thinking in space. So it involves things like navigating, Wayfinding, finding your way to somewhere you need to go, um, learning a new space, learning the layout of a new space. Um, again, um, you know, having been in Canberra for what two months now, you know, I'm kind of gradually getting the layout of the city. Although, as we'll talk about in a minute, I have a GPS which is impeding that. Um, uh, you know, orientation, sort of having a sense of how you're oriented when you're in a, when you're in an environment that you know. So that was one of my problems this morning. We drove into one parking lot, and I, I was where I thought I was. I thought I was oriented actually 90 degrees off from where I was actually oriented. So that's why I was sort of confused. Um, reorienting. So have you ever had the experience where you go into a building, you know, and then you come out from a different door, and you're like, where am I? Or you go, or in a subway or something. You come out of a subway, and you say, and you need to say, well, which way am I facing, right? And how do you reorient, right? Um, and perspective taking, this is actually, I didn't, um, I'm not going to talk about as much, but, you know, just imagining what, what somebody, uh, somebody else's perspective. So if you're giving somebody directions, for example, you know, for how to get your house, you have to imagine what way are they going to be facing in the environment to say, well, do you turn right or do you turn left? And that might be different from how you're currently facing yourself. So all of these are, are sort of at the scale of environments. And I'm not going to go into this, but I did some work with looking at these spatial ability tests that we've just been showing you to see how well they predict 
things like learning the layout of a new space and being able to point to things in a new space. And it turns out they don't predict very well. So there seems to, it's like just because somebody's good at mental rotation, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're good at navigating buildings and vice versa, okay? There's some, some cor correlation, but it's relatively small. I'd say, you know, less than 10% of the variance is shared. Um, then there's the scale of objects. Um, which is kind of what these tests are measuring, right? Our ability to imagine transformations of objects. So this occurs in mental rotation, in things like origami, um, which I know some kids are doing in schools around here these days, and in things like me mechanical reasoning, trying to figure out which way different parts of a machine are going to rotate when the machine is working. And then, but then there are also scales, I mean, th th those are the two main scales at which we experience space, but there's also scales that we d can't experience, right? So, so this picture on the left is uh, Crick and Watson with their model of DNA, right? And they couldn't see DNA, right? But what they did was they created a representation of DNA, which turned out to be an actual physical model, right? And they were able, that, by creating this representation and looking at that representation and um, thinking about it, they can now understand the structure of DNA, but they can never look at DNA. Similarly, um, you know, with, um, when we're thinking about processes on the earth, you know, like climate or weather or whatever, um, we can't experience all the earth, we can't, we can't see the whole earth at once, right? Unless you happen to be an astronaut out in space, and even then you're not seeing the whole thing. So again, we can use, but we can use these representations. We can represent, so we don't, we know, you know the sort of the structure and the shape of the continents, not because you directly experienced that, but because you saw maps, right? which are representations, and again, something like the solar system is at a higher scale again, which certainly, um, you know, and so, so for scales that we, we can't directly experience, what we do is we, what we're really related, we're not actually interacting with the actual thing, we're interacting with a representation of the thing. But again, it's a spatial representation that keeps the, you know, the, pr trans the preserves the spatial relations in the, in the original thing that it's representing. And then the last thing, a type of spatial reasoning I want to talk about is when you reason about something by sort of in a spatial way, even though the thing itself is not inherently spatial. And we do this a huge amount in language. Um, Lakoff has written books and books about this. And when you read his books, you realize every sentence you say almost has some sort of spatial metaphor in it. So, you know, if you say, I climbed the corporate ladder, I'm feeling down today, I follow the path of life, these are all spatial metaphors for things that are not inherently spatial, right? Um, you know, maybe, you know, you're not necessarily higher up in the building when you're high on the corporate ladder, right? But, so you're using a spatial metaphor, and we do this very naturally. Um, another way we do it is, when even with verbal reasoning, um, you know, we can, um, we, we often sort of translate their information into some sort of a spatial representation. This is an example from um, some work I did about 10 years ago. Um, like if we, I tell you the dog is smarter than the bear and the cat is smarter than the frog and the bear is smarter than the frog. Um, and then I say, well, is it true that the dog is smarter than the frog, whatever. Um, a lot of people, what they will tell you, what they will do is they say, oh, I lined them up in my mind in terms of how smart they were, right? So again, you're not, you know, whether somebody's smart or not is not a spatial thing, but people put it in a spatial form and that helps them reason about it. And then there's things like graphs. So this is arguably the first graph ever published. Um, it's the balance of trade of Britain against a bunch of other countries, kind of relevant uh, these days. But um, so basically what we do with the graph is, you, again, you're taking something like you know, the value, you know, the, 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 the balance of trade, which is a numerical thing, and you're turning it into a spatial representation, right? And by doing that, you can see patterns. You can see, oh, you know, for these years, the balance was against Britain, and then for the next years, the balance was for Britain. And, you, and it sort of pops out at you. You get this, you know, by putting this numerical data into a graph, you suddenly, you see relationships that you wouldn't necessarily see if those same things were in a table. So graphs are really powerful ways of reasoning using space to reason about other things. And i just like to put this up because it was, this was pointed out to me by Herbert Simon, who's a Nobel Prize winner who was on my dissertation committee. Um, and I always like to put it on there. Um, uh, and uh, he's a, an economist, but he, an economist turned psychologist. And um, he pointed out the musical notation is actually a graph with time on the x-axis and um, pitch on the y-axis. 
And by the way, I know I'm talking all about STEM right today. I do believe that spatial ability is just as important for the arts and I just had to keep my talk to an hour so I couldn't talk about that and I haven't done that much work in it myself. But uh, I, do, I don't think it's just STEM, I think it's, um, it's important for the arts too. And hopefully we'll get that to talk about that more in the next um, couple of days. Okay, so spatial thinking then I think is basically reasoning, thinking, solving problems and learning about spatial structures and processes, but it's also using spatial, it's also about using spatial representations to think about both spatial and non-spatial topics, okay? So that's sort of the first part of the talk. So then the next question is, how do we think spatially, right? What are we doing when we're thinking about space or using space to think? The first point I want to make here is that I think that when we're, when we're doing spatial thinking, we're sort of using a variety of different strategies that range from, you know, a lot of sort of visualizing or imagining things, sort of imagining things, visualizing them in the mind's eye, but also more analytic processes such as verbal and numerical reasoning. So I'm going to show you some examples of that. Um, and actually we're going to start with sort of this classic task. This is really important in con classic um, mental rotation task that, um, that's really important in cognitive psychology. Because it was, it was really important for sort of um, really making the case that, you know, some, like a mental imagery, that really a, a situation where you actually imagine something and imagine it transforming in your mind, that that can actually be functional in, in thinking. And so the general task again in mental rotation is that um, you see two objects and you have to say whether they could be, whether they're the same object, is one just the other one rotated in space or are they different objects? And for the first one, I believe the answer is yes. And for the second one, it's also yes, right? They both, yeah, okay, so I didn't give you an, a, a no, but basically in the experiments half the time, usually it's no. And what's really interesting about this is when people do this task, I mean, and when people, you know, they were high spatial ability people, I, I will say. Um, when people do this task, the time it takes them to answer whether the two objects are the same or different is a linear function of the, the, ang the difference in angle between the two objects. So if they're only different by 15 degrees, they answer really fast. If they're different by 30, they answer a bit longer. If they're different by 60. And it, I mean, in the original experiments, this was a re I mean, they were, these people were somewhat practiced and they were high spatial ability, I'll say all that, but it was really a linear effect. And so basically, on the basis of this, um, Shepard and Metzler argued that this is really evidence that people are sort of, you know, for what's called, you know, they, they, they're representing these iconically. At some, at some level, this representation that's inside their mind is like the object, and they're rotating it, and it's sort of an analog transformation in the sense that it has to go through, to go, rotate from here to here. You have to go through all the intermediate stages, just like you would if you're rotating a real object. And so, and, and they also, you know, that you seem to be rotating the whole object. That turns out not always to be true. Um, and so it was evidence for this sort of that really visualizing things is important in thinking. And, or, um, you know, or what's sometimes called mental simulation. I'm going to call these visualizing, mental simulation, imagistic thinking. They're going to be called different things because different collaborators of mine call them different things. But, um, but they're the same thing. This idea that you can actually imagine something in your mind and that can actually solve a problem for you. So, um, so anyway, so that's great. And I mean, this is probably the best, most clear case of that in cognitive psychology. But so now let's look at the test that's used as probably the most commonly used spatial ability test, um, um, to, especially when people are looking at relationships between spatial ability and performance in, in math and science. And it's, the, it's called the Vandenberg rota mental rotation test. Again, it's the it's the same ca task, except same objects even, but see, the, uh, there's an object on the left, there's four on the right, and you have to say which of them could be the same object. And I'm, again, I'm not gonna do it. I'll do one for you in a minute. And um, so it's, 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 it's um, one of the most commonly used spatial tests, and it's probably the spatial measure that shows the largest sex difference in favor of males, okay? So up to a standard deviation. So, um, I um, recently said, well, okay, and, and everybody assumes that because this, ob this test is, uses the same objects as the Shepard and Metzler task, that in fact what people are doing when they're doing this task is mental rotation. So 
a few years ago, I decided to just have people talk aloud while they're doing this test to see what they were doing, okay? Now these are, as I say, are people doing it for the first time. They're not highly practiced. And there were some people, actually most people did some sort of version of mental rotation. I look at the block of the circle and tried to reposition them in my mind, visualizing it. So that's, they felt they were visualizing it. But then some people were doing perspective taking. I tried to imagine um, that I could look, look at it from a different perspective and what it would look like from that different perspective. So these people are actually imagining themselves moving around the object rather than the object moving. But then there were people who were counting cubes. Um, I, liked, I, I, liked, I tried to like, tried to cancel out the ones I couldn't, that couldn't be by looking at the number of squares. And then there were people um, that were say, looking at the overall shape, right? Well, the first strategy is to eliminate, is to look at the end blocks to see what direction they were pointing to, and then often, but not always, eliminate one or two. So here's an item from this test. And there was actually a difference between this test and the original Shepard and Metzler task. Because in the original Shepard and Metzler task, if the object was not the same object, it was always a mirror image of it. But on this test, on half of the items, where the object is not the same object, it actually has a different shape. And so you can see that here. So here's the object on the left, and you can see that the two ends are sort of, they're parallel to each other, kind of and pointing in opposite directions, right? But um, the for the next one over, they're perpendicular to each other, right? then they're parallel again, then they're perpendicular, then they're par parallel. So by just looking at whether the two ends are parallel or perpendicular, you can actually tell whether it's the same or different, right? And you don't have to do this mental rotation at all, okay? Men actually are more likely to use this strategy. Um, the, we're calling it the analytic strategy. Um, it's also associated with better people who, who say they're using this strategy are doing better on the task. Um, it's used on more difficult problems. So, um, my recent study with my grad student, Alex Boone, it's in press now, we actually went back to the original Shepard and Master task and made all these angles from zero to 180 and, and, and controlled it. And what happened was, for the sh smaller angles, if you're only rotating about 90 degrees, people use metal rotation. And you saw that linear increase with the thing. After that, it flattened out. And when we, uh, and people, it turns out people were switching to this alternative strategy if they could. Um, and when it's available, we made a t version of the task where, all, where it was, it was all, that's, you could always use that strategy, and then we told people to use the strategy, and the sex difference went away. So, so basically, from this work, I'm saying, I'm not saying that there isn't a big difference, that I think mental rotation is an important task, and in fact, ha for half the items, you pretty much have to use it. I think our research says, yes, there is a difference between men and women in, in the mental rotation process, but there's also a difference in using this alternative strategy. And in fact, when people notice this internal, uh, alternative strategy, it's easier, um, at least on the larger angles, and they use it. So this is an example of sort of a task, you know, that, you know, visualization is part of it, but there's also, um, a, there's also a more analytic way of doing it, and people look for these. They do this all the time. Um, and those, so those are the two items. Um, so now I'm going to look at, give you some other examples of different strategies that kids use, or uh, different people. So this is really old work from, math, from a, a study I did on uh, math problem solving, actually for my master's thesis in Ireland in 1983, although it didn't get published until 99. Um, so you give people a problem, kids a problem. These were, I think, about 10-year-old kids. Um, a hitchhiker set out on a journey of 60 miles. He walked the first mi five miles and then got a lift. I have to change this for the American audience from um, a lorry driver or a truck driver, and when the driver dropped him off, he still had half of his journey to travel. How many had he traveled? So it's sort of a typical word problem, right? So some kids, what they would do is they would either draw or imagine something like this. They'd actually draw out the thing and said, okay, walk for five miles, you know, he had 30 miles left, so we'd mark that off on the other side, and then the middle part is what's left. Other kids just went straight to sort of, um, you know, Computation said, okay, 60 over 2 is 30, so half of 60 is 30, so that's the amount traveled. Uh, 30 minus 5 is 25, subtract so the miles walked, and, you know, um, he walked 25 miles in the lorry. Um, now, there, I mean, it's really the same process, but one is being done in a more visual way on the diagram, right, and the other one is just being done computationally. Um, interesting. Um, on this task, we could, we, could, we could order people from sort of kids that were sort of more visual and that, that they tended to use some sort of diagram or, or 
imagery on most problems, and those are the ones who were said no, they just use computations, right? And interesting, this, so, and this is a big, this is, there's been a lot of work on this so-called visualizer, verbalizer um, distinction. Interesting, that this was not related to their performance. What we found, however, was that you have to, if you look at both, whether they, you know, what, what sort of, whether they were using visual or verbal solutions, and also looked at their spatial ability, we got some interesting patterns. And particularly, we said, it seemed that those who were saying they were using lots of imagery, but they were high spatial, they did really well, and the ones that said they were using lots of imagery and were, had low spatial ability were doing badly, and it turns out they were imaging, di imagining different things. The high spatial people were imagining like something like that diagram, right? Something very schematic with the different parts. The, 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 the low spatial visualizers were saying things like, you know, um, do I have that? I just imagined them outside of house ha hitchhiking. So they were coming up with like, a, you know? So I think, you know, it, it's sort of, Visualizer, verbalizer is not the whole story, and you know it's it's really about what sort of visual representations you're imagining or drawing, right? Um, another thing I want to say is that although there's, um, you know, the, the you know the, I think the jury is out about whether if you give you know if somebody's use more visual or verbal strategies in say math problem solving that that necessarily means they're a visualizer in every part of their lives. I think that's still something that needs to be. We shouldn't necessarily assume. Um, so, other another um, other examples of where uh, maybe you know people use more visual or um, more analytic st um, strategies to solve problems. Um, so, this is an example from um, work on um, mechanical reasoning by Schwartz and Black, and they gave people problems where they give them gear chains like this, and they would have to you know they'd say, okay, the big gear is turning clockwise. You see the arrow there you know, which direction is gear A going to turn, right? And they, they sort of gave people these problems, they'd never really thought about this before, and they just looked at the evolution of their strategies over, um, a, you know, an hour or so. And what happened was in the beginning, people are like, first of all, they're using lots of imagery, and their hands are the gears, like, this one's going this way, so this one's going this way, and then this one's going this way, so this one's going this way. So they would, you know, they would be using a lot of imagery and really using their hands to simulate the objects. Then they started to say, go, they went to more like, okay, we'll draw an arrow on this, we'll draw an arrow on this, and et cetera. Eventually they figured out, oh, wait a second, every other gear goes the same way, right? So I can just go clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, right? So they learned a rule, a regularity, and that they, which meant that they didn't actually have to simulate anymore. They didn't have to imagine these things moving anymore, and from then on they used that. But if they gave them a more complex problem, so there was a problem where all the gears form a circle, and now you have to, it turns out, you have to say, well, will these gears turn? And they'll only turn if it's an even number of gears. When they gave them this novel problem, they went back to visualizing again until they figured out the rule and then they used the rule. So I think this is sort of, I think this is central to sort of what goes on in STEM thinking. And the last example, because I'll be coming to, is from um, organic chemistry. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I was interested in working on organic chemistry was because it seems like the sorts of tasks they have to do are just like these tests that the, the cognitive psychologists do. So you see two objects, these are, these are diagrams of a molecule, there's a, there's a carbon in the middle and then it's connected to four different what are called substituents. You know, one is a carbon atom, or one, one is a chlorine, one is a OH, hydroxyl, you don't really, they just connect it to four different things. And you have to say, and it turns out in chemistry, um, you know, like if two molecules like that have the same objects connected to each other in the same way could still, if the, if the you know, they might still be, um, they, they might, they might they, just because, you know, there's four same things are connected to a carbon doesn't mean that those two ide molecules are identical because just the, the ordering of those substituents might make a real difference. And that was, for example, the problem with thalidomide, that there were actually two different isomers of the same molecule. They didn't realize it. And one, you know, was a cure for morning sickness and the other one caused birth defects. And that's what happened with thalidomide. So what chemists have to do is they have to look at these molecules and they have to say, is this the same structure? Is it different? Are these things arranged differently? And um, Mike Steiff, who I've, I've done a lot of work with, did this work. And he, um, he had, gave people these diagrams. They were, um, and they had to say whether these, these um, two molecules were the same or different. And um, where they, again, are they the same or an anteromers, which is mirror images? So it's really like that Shepard and Messer task. 
And what he found was that novices, again, would be rotating these objects and see, can I rotate to this, to this? But experts, there were some cases when experts would say, oh no, there has to be the same thing, because if two of the substituents were the same, it turns out it's always the case, there's, there's no, there aren't two versions of this molecule. There's only, you know, they can always be, be rotated to be con congruent. So experts would use these rules, and they would only use metal rotation if they needed to. So it's again, and, and, and I think working with Mike has really convinced me that, you know, although visualization is really important in science, it only gets you so far, and in fact, scientists are always looking for ways of representing things so that they could do them in a more algorithmic way so they don't have to visualize, because I mean, you, when you get to these really, you know, really complicated molecules, I mean, this visualization process that we have, it's sort of very limited, so we can only visualize things that are, only, that are so complex. Okay, and then last example, just from navigation, um, there are people who like to, who say they navigate because they always, they just always sort of, you know, think about where they need to go and where they need to turn right and where they need to turn left. They just think about the routes, the route of where, you know, they remember the routes of where they need to go in the, um, in, in the environment. Whereas other people say, no, I have a cognitive map. I have, you know, I have an understanding of the relationship between things in space. And, you know, so I can just, find shortcuts, I can, you know, I just know where something is and then I go in that direction, right? So there's sort of this, this different type of strat, this type of um, distinction. And um, this is work we've been doing in our lab, um, again, following up on work by Marchetti. Um, basically, it's in a virtual environment. This is a map of a virtual environment and people kind of are led on a, a route through this environment and they learn this route really well. And like, so this is like a little set of corridors here and they might, is this, this doesn't have a, no. So um, they learn this, they go through this route and they learn a route really well in this environment. And if you can see where the, the stars are in this map, those are, those are landmarks, okay? And those are pointed out to them as they go along. And then what we do to test them is we put them at one of the landmarks and tell them to navigate to another landmark. And the question is, do they use the well-learned route, which might be, you know, this very verbal thing saying, oh, I go forward and I turn right at the piano and I turn left at the, at the fountain or whatever. Um, or do they find a shortcut? And again, people really vary from people who um, this index of like how many shortcuts over all successful trials. And some people use the shortcut all the time. Some people use the routes all the time. And a lot of people are in between. So again, you can see this sort of, there's this variation in what strategies people use. And again, you might think of this sort of idea of having a map in your head of the environment as more of a visual strategy and the other one as maybe more of a verbal strategy. And as I say, this is, what's, this is what messed me up this morning because I actually had a cognitive map of where this building was, but I didn't know the routes to it. So it's not, I mean, some people feel, it's, women tend to say they do use more routes and men use more cognitive maps, but, and so then people think, oh, it's better to use, the cognitive map strategy is better, it's more flexible. But this morning was a case where having the route strategy would have been more, more useful to me. Okay, where's my time here? Okay. Okay, so how do we think spatially? Um, I think we use a range of visualization and analytic thinking. We use a range of strategies. Some of these depend more on mental imagery or visualizing things in the mind's eye. Some are more analytic or abstract and depend more on verbal and mathematical reasoning. Um, neither is always best. Um, we often see a visual to analytic shift with expertise, or at least people are starting to see more evidence for that. And, you know, I think Thinking about space often involves going back and forth between the two modes. Okay. Um, another way we think about space is that we depend a lot on, not just on representations or visualizations in our minds, but external visualizations or representations. So, you know, things like diagrams, um, uh, maps, and graphs. And also, you know, with new technologies, um, you know, these external representations of things we want to think about might be, you know, on a computer screen. They might be animations. They might be interactive visualizations. And, you know, the everyday example is a GPS. And as I say, I think I would actually have a much better cognitive map of Canberra if I didn't have a GPS, because um, uh, we've, been we've been relying on it a lot since we've been here. And they might be virtual environments. So I'm kind of um, um, sort of thinking about these very broadly. Um, one thing is that these, um, so di let's talk about diagrams in particular, because I think diagrams are used a lot in science, and, um, but also can be a sort of a source of difficulty for students. Um, so these are different diagrams, so a cross-section of the brain, 
um, then there's a pulley system. I did a lot of work on pulley systems in my life. And um, on the right, you see sort of what's basically a picture of a pulley system, right, that you might use in, you know, um, sailing, etc. cetera. Um, the left is sort of a diagram of that that might be in a physics or textbook, right? And you can see it's very abstract, right? Um, and, you know, you just sort of, you, you don't really see, I mean, they, these are actually, sorry, they're different pulley systems, sorry. But, um, but you can see, you know, pulleys are represented by circles and ropes by lines, and you don't necessarily see that the rope's going inside the pulley, you know, so you have to, it's much more abstract of the situation. This is a representation of a chemistry molecule. Um, again, you know, these, you've got two carbons at the two sides here, and each of those is connected to different other atoms or groups of atoms. And one, like you need to know, for example, that, you know, this is actually a 2D drawing of a 3D object. The sort of dashed lines are things that are kind of going into the background. The, the wedges are things that are coming towards you, and the lines are things that are pretty much in the plane of the page. But again, there's a lot of convention here. These are uh, block diagrams used in geology, you know, where you, you see this, what's on the surface of the earth, and then you're inferring what's happening underneath. Feynman diagrams, I don't understand, but physics, you, physicists use them. And um, these are, uh, this is a cladogram, which is used in evolutionary biology. So these are all sorts of different types of diagrams. Now, I think what you need to know about diagrams is they're not transparent to students, right? Um, they're, they're not pictures. They often represent non-spatial information, like graphs and cladograms. Um, but even when they represent spatial information, they often show things that we can't see in reality, right? Um, they're showing 3D and 2D. They show views of things we can't see in reality, like cross sections, and they're, they abstract from reality. They often, you know, pull out, only show you some things about the object and not all the details. So, some, um, so for example, as cross sections, rotations. Sometimes to um, understand something, you need to rotate. Projections is another one. Um, you know, a map of the Earth, it, it's projected, it's a three-dimensional thing projected on 2D, you have to understand how that projection is done to be able to understand the structure here. Two different projections of um, the 3D map onto the 2D. So, um, so just I want to give you some examples of how these representations, these very type, various types of representations are difficult for students. Um, so this is from work we did on um, students understanding physics diagrams, so graphs of, of, um, of motion. So this is a graph of, we showed people this graph of position over time, and, um, and they, we asked people to interpret it. And the high spatial students, you know, again, I mean, this is a case of where spatial ability matters. They would say, well, there's one interval of time where the object is not changing, because position is staying constant. Then, um, <coughs> it cannot move, it has a con and then the next interval, it has a constant velocity, because you're seeing this thing moving, right? And then there's another phase where it's not moving at all, and that's the correct interpretation of this graph. But a low spatial student said, oh, the car consistently, the car goes constantly and then goes down the hill. It doesn't change. So they were thinking of this graph as a picture. And this is something that had been, in, that had been documented with children, but this is college students. Okay, so even college students are, you know, they don't necessarily, I mean, this, and this is a fairly abstract graph, I admit, but they don't, you know, they're, they're having that same thing where they're assuming the graph is actually a picture. Um, another case, this is a, another case from an early study of mine where people had to, I taught them something about pulley systems and they learned, they had to learn the structure of certain pulley systems and think about them in various ways. And they either learned them by looking at real pulley systems or by looking at diagrams of pulley systems. And later they had to draw like an example of the pulley system that they'd learned about. And somebody who got a diagram drew something like this. So what did they see? Well, there's a bunch of circles that are connected by lines, right? That's what they represented. They didn't represent, you know, these lines are actually representing the rope going over one pulley and under the other. Now people, students, who saw the real pulleys and didn't see the diagrams didn't make this error. So it's not an error of drawing ability, right? It was that they just didn't understand the diagram and they didn't tell me, <laughs> tell us that they didn't understand it, right? So, they're, 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 so when you make things too schematic, children, you know, um, students may not actually understand what the diagram is showing. And then this is another case of where people had to imagine a cross section of an object and, 
Um, they were able to rotate this object so they could see that it was actually an egg-shaped object, and they were supposed to imagine that you slice the object and then take, remove the top part and look, at, look down at the object. And this is, again, on the right is what they should have drawn, and, this, and, and you see what two high spatial ability students drew, and that's, um, um, you know, pretty good. But then you'll see the low spatial ability people, um, they, they, didn't, they didn't draw it correctly. And so what they didn't get was that, you know, I'm drawing it from the perspective, it's an egg, right? So I'm drawing it from this perspective, so I should draw a circle. They're drawing, but they, you know, they're seeing the side of the egg, right? So they, they really are not able to visualize this. So just the, that was a short thing, but just to say that external re spatial representations like graphs, diagrams, maps, and interactive visualizations can be powerful tools in spatial thinking, but these representations are highly, they're highly conventionalized and they sometimes require kind of spatial thinking just even to understand what the diagram is showing. So, third part of the talk then, how should we educate spatial thinking given all this? So, um, so I started by saying, you know, we know there's strong evidence now that spatial, that if you, if you measure somebody's spatial ability at age 13, that predicts whether they're going to be successful in science later in their lives. And on the basis of this, um, Lubinsky and his colleagues who have really, who really did this work have made a strong argument that, you know, what we're doing by, by that, you know, in gifted education, we usually select people based on math and science, or math and verbal ability. And if we were selecting people, if we were using spatial ability, we're missing out on some of the really potentially creative, great scientists by not measuring spatial ability. And I think that's a really good point. And they've, they've, they, you know, they've equations in their studies of how many people are missing out on, et cetera. So I think one thing we should do, you know, given that, is, is encourage high spatial students to go into STEM and say, you know, say, you're really good at this, you know, you should get into a science career. But, I mean, this isn't the whole story because what, this doesn't help the people who have low spatial ability, right? Are we saying to them, oh, sorry, you can't, too bad you can't be a scientist. We hope we'd like to be able to give them the opportunity to be scientists if they want to. Another issue, of course, is that the people who are half spatially gifted, they may not be interested in science, so we can't force them all to go into science, right? So, so I think this is one part of the puzzle. Um, another part of the puzzle that people are working on is, um, is uh, training. So that's, now let's that's, that's try and train people's spatial skills and um, maybe, and then see, you know, you know, because we haven't really been doing that, right? And, um, and a lot of, there's a lot of work like this going on, but I think a lot of the work is, what they're doing is they're saying, oh, mental rotation is a spatial skill, so I'm going to train people on mental rotation and then hope they're going to be better at STEM. And I think that's kind of misguided, because just because mental rotation predicts STEM doesn't mean that that is the causal factor, right? It could be that both performance in mental rotation and performance in STEM are reflecting something else. Or it may be even that the kid at 13 is good at mental rotation because they've always been interested in science and in doing science, they got better at spatial thinking, right? So we don't know the direction of causality. And, but I think more generally, um, and, and, and as, a, as a result, there's not, not very much evidence to date uh, about, um, and there was a good summary paper by Stipend Utah last year pointing this out, that um, you know, just training people on something like mental rotation or paper folding is necessarily going to make them better at STEM. Um, um, so, but I think this really, I mean, I think this of course is a, is, is a good approach, but it really begs the question of what spatial skills should we train and what, how should we train? So, um, so the approach that I and my colleagues have been using is really to you know, think more broadly about um, spatial thinking and um, you say, well, it should be informed by our understanding of the nature of spatial thinking. And I don't claim that I've figured out everything about spatial thinking, but, um, so, um, but the two things that I have figured out to some extent that I told you about is first that spatial thinking involves an interplay between visualization and more analytic reasoning, and that it involves reasoning with external representations, but those are not always easy for people, okay? So, um, so I just want to give you an example this really of one study that we did where we really took, you know, we said, well, oh, actually, no, I should say this. So, you know, we, we know that there's an inter interplay of spatial thinking is in, is involves both visualization and analytical, you know, and then I suggested at least in one study, some people were, seem to be more visual and some people seem to be um, more analytic in the way of thinking. And what a lot of people 
think, oh, well, okay, there's visual kids and there's verbal kids, so we're going to teach the ki visual kids visually and the verbal kids verbally. That's a very, very um, popular idea, I think, in education. Turns out there's, been a, there's a really good report that, um, that was written by psychologists um, a few years ago that says there's absolutely no evidence for this. And uh, my colleague, Richard Mayer, uh, who John knows well, um, did a, you know, years of research on this where he actually did, you know, test people various ways as being more visual and verbal and tested with more with the visual people with more diagrams of verbal people. It didn't work, okay? Um, so um, what I believe and um, is that given that there's the visual and verbal ways of solving problems, you should teach everybody all the strategies. And in fact, I think that in science, you're constantly going back and forth between these two strategies. So um, the example from the, of the study we did, and this was actually one of the few studies I've done in a real educational setting as opposed to a lab um, with Mike Steiff and Bonnie Dixon. First of all, we, we did a, you know, we've done some previous studies with, um, we developed, uh, with organic chemistry problems. And again, um, in organic chemistry, they use a lot of different diagrams and they all, like, so you have, might have a three, you know, you have a three-dimensional structure of a molecule. There might be a, let's say this is the molecule, there's a diagram that views it from this perspective. There's a diagram, a different view, a diagram that views it, for, that, that represents it from this perspective, a different one that represents it from this perspective. And these are all used for different purposes in, 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 in chemistry. So what students have to often do is, you know, sort of relate different diagrams of the same object. And so this was a, a study, this was a, a problem in, a pro, in, in chemistry where this is a side view of a molecule, this is a front, and then you have two, which is, this is called a dash wedge diagram, I told you about that before. Then these are two different, two di a different type of diagram that represents the molecule from a different perspective, okay? And what they had to do was say, which of the two on the right was different from the one on the left? And what we found was people used a range of strategies. Some people said, oh, I imagined the 3D structure and I rotated it and then, you know. But other people said, well, I sort of ordered, like, so, you know, based on knowing what's in front and behind, which this diagram tells you, I ordered, you know, the, said, well, there's the bromine, the chlorine, and the CH3. I, I figured out the ordering of them on one side of the molecule and then I related that to the other one and then I figured out the ordering on the other side. So that's a much more analytic way of doing the problem. And so students um, used, uh, and, and some people just ignored what was on the left, they just translated, they drew, based on the one on the right, they drew a diagram like the one on the left and then see, looked to see which one actually represented the, the diagram. So they used a range of strategies. And, uh, oops, oh, we're again. Um, and so we did this big study in Bonnie Dixon's class. She's a, she was teaching organic chemistry in a big university. And she taught three different cohorts of students, um, three different, th th taught them or beginning organic chemistry three different ways. One group, she really taught them, she brought in lots of models to class, she made them, really got them to think about visualizing, think about this, think about this object, what it would look like in this perspective, from this perspective, a lot of visual stuff. Another group, she, said, she gave them sort of the analytic tricks, you know, order the items on the left hand of the molecule and the ones on the right and see which ones, and there's rules, there's, if you've ever taken organic chemistry, there's, there's all sorts of names for these things, and they, they really, they're very much codified in, in organic chemistry. Taught, really taught them the analytic tricks, and then there was a group that got equal amounts of both. And these were given in um, sort of, you know, three, these extra um, and intervention was done in three discussion sections and three homework assignments. And before and after they, they did, got this intervention, we gave people 12 problems, and asked them to report it, to do the problems and report their strategies. <coughs> and we asked, gave them the same 12 problems at the end. We also looked at their grades in the class. So first of all, um, this is the three types of people. The people were taught with visualization, analytic strategies, or both. And these graphs show how much they were using um, these more imagery or visualizing strategies. And so before they got the training, you see most people were using visual strategies on most problems. By the end of the class, everybody was doing more analytic stuff, but that was more true of people who were in the, um, the, 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 the um, analytic group. Uh, another thing that happened was everybody, again, both males and females, switched from doing more visual to more analytic strategies, but that happened more for females than for males, okay? Now, when we look at how they did on both our problems and the course, what you find is that um, in, the, you know, and again, this is a big class, and there's, you know, 
we can only impact so much in a big class. So they look like relatively small effects, but they're highly significant. Um, in, if they were trained with just, you know, emphasizing imagery strategies, to see the men did better than the women. If they were trained with just analytic strategies, the men did better than the women. But if we, they were, the, peop, the, the group that was um, trained with both types of strategies, turns out there was no sex difference. It looks like the women did better. It's not a significant difference. But, um, and that carried over into their actual class grades. So the, in, again, in the, two the two classes were, um, they were taught either imagery only, they were only taught one strategy, the men did better than the women, but um, in the case where they were taught, they were taught about the, really how these two strategies related to each other and the interplay between the visual and the analytic, everybody did better and the women did as well as the men. So, um, you know, I think our, our interpretation of this is somewhat speculative, but um, I think what's really going on here is that, you know, these imagery strategies of visualizing molecules, they're limited. I mean, we have limited working memory or, you know, CPU in our minds, and you can only do so much visualization. And, and at some point, you'd really, to work something out, you really have to move to an analytic approach. Um, and um, I think really what happened was that, the, you know, if you, but if you don't, if you haven't, if you don't have the visual, and you learn the analytic, it's like, it sort of becomes a set of arbitrary rules and you don't know what it relates to, right? So I think that the, the, what happened was that the, you know, first of all, you know, men on average are better at mental rotation, so training them to do it that way, they're going to be more effective. I think they ben men, affected, men benefited more than the women on the analytic strategies because they had that visual sense to begin with. But what, what works for the women is giving them both strategies and showing them how they related to each other. So this is very speculative, but that's kind of my current understanding of what happened there. Um, and um, you know, I think that um, imagery strategies, as I say, they only get you so far because of the limits of our mind. Um, analytic strategies, they tend to be very task specific. And you know, sometimes when you get a novel problem, you have to go back and visualize it again. Um, and, and also these analytic strategies, if you don't ground them in the reality that they relate to, I think pe they miss, people just misapply them. And then um, um, I think the, the combined strategy provided the grounding for those analytic strategies. Okay, so basically I think there's an imagery to analytic shift with learning and we saw that in the study. Um, mental rotation seems to be the default strategy in lots of cases but other strategies are adopted when they can, and teaching that integrates imagistic and analytic thinking is more effective. And in this case, eliminated the sex difference. So, um, okay, now I have to see how much time I've left. About 10, 10 minutes? Five minutes, okay, so I have to do this really quickly. <laughs> so, um, so uh, another thing I told you about spatial thinking is, you know, that we seem to depend a lot on external representations and, um, and, and, and um, you know, but yet novices struggle with these external representations. And, you know, again, one idea might say, oh, well, with new technologies, we don't have to show them these schematic diagrams of molecules. We can show them the real thing and they can walk around it in virtual reality. And, you know, we can show them really realistic interactive things. I personally don't think that's, it's that easy. <laughs> um, um, I think, first of all, I think these more abstracted representations are really important because they actually abstract out information that you need for a certain problem and you're not distracted by other things. And I think technology has a huge role in this, but I think we have to really think about how to use it effectively. So I'm gonna skip over a bunch of stuff. We don't have time for it. Um, but let's talk about um, using visualizations. Um, so, um, so we did some studies in the lab where we gave people a problem and then we gave them some sort of visualization or model that helped them solve the problem. And we looked at how they used it. And, and, and basically, um, so, I mean, this was kind of a strange task, but they, this is the same task where they had to imagine cross sections of objects. And, um, you know, this would be the correct cross section of this object and, and, and this would be the incorrect cross section. And what we did was we gave them, we gave them a visualization, we gave them a, um, an interactive visualization that would help them solve this problem, where they could rotate this object. And it turns, and so they could sort of rotate the object kind of, oops, back and forth from different views. I mean, they, you know, in, and they actually had this, see this egg thing in their hand, and it was like linked so that when they rotated like this, they, the object on the, ground, on, the, on the screen rotated accordingly. So this should have been really helpful to them, 
And, and it turns out the people that use it, the people that rotated it to view the object from the perspective that the cross section was to be drawn from, um, that's what they needed to do. The, the successful people did that. But the bottom line is, you know, this is sort of again a range of who did who who did that. Some people did it in zero trials. Somebody did it in most of the trials. And we sort of just split this into users and non-users, people who did the right thing and people who didn't use the right thing, and that indeed predicted performance on the task. We did the same thing with organic chemistry, and um, we gave people these tasks where we had said we give them one diagram from a molecule, they have to draw a different diagram that represents the molecule from a different perspective, and this time we gave them a physical model and looked to see what they did with this physical model, and again, the, the effect of the people who were good, what they did was they, they would align the, mo the model with the diagram they were given, then they would rotate it, and then they would draw it, okay? So that's what they should have done. And again, some people did that and some people didn't. And, and in this study, we had a group, a control group that didn't get the model at all. We had people who got the model but didn't rotate it, and there were people who got the model and did rotate it. And you can see the people who got the model and didn't rotate it were no better than the people who didn't see a model at all. So just seeing that model didn't work. And on their own, the students just didn't figure out how to use it. A lot of students couldn't figure out how to use this, right? Some people did, and they did really well. So um, I have to, so basically, what we, you know, and we did many studies just encouraging them, saying this is really important, people who use this model do better on the problems, didn't work. So what worked for us was using this model as a feedback. We had one group that, you know, were, um, that, you know, they, they, they got the models, but what they had to do, they had to draw the diagram, they were given a diagram, they had to draw it, and then they had to use the model to grade themselves. So it's like, here, match the model to the diagram you're given, satisfy yourself, it's the same, that's the same molecule. Now I want you to try and match it to what you drew. And if it, if it matched, it meant you drew it correctly, you had the structure of that molecule right, it, but often what had happened, people would, in trying to, they would switch to components or something, and they wouldn't be able to align it, right? So the model was used as feedback for their own problem solving. That worked really well. Um, uh, so basically, the students, as you can see, who got that intervention, they went from getting 20% of the problems right to getting 80%, almost 80% of them right. So it was really effective. The people who, you know, the control group approved a little bit, but not much. And then we, we actually did the very, we found, we did follow-up studies where instead of physical models, we had virtual models. And um, basically, as you can see here, is the, the handheld is the physical model here. We got the same effect, the um, people who, um, you were able to use these models for feedback, did much better on the post-test, and it didn't matter whether it was a physical model or a virtual model. And they'd even, you know, then we took the models away and they had to do some problems without the models and they still did better. We brought them back a week later, they had to do the problems without the models and they still did better. So, um, so I think that, you know, one way anyway that we have figured out that of teaching these people, teaching people to um, learn these complex new representations is to sort of not just, you know, you don't just provide them with the visualization. You don't, I mean, just encouraging them, telling this will help you is not going to work. It. You have to come up with a, a sort of a, a, a learning sequence that forces them to use it and to benefit, to experience the benefit of the model, and then they get it and then they learn. Um, and we showed, I mean, we have similar work in animation where people are trying to learn, you know, they, they show them an animation of a mechanical system and they, you know, and they're supposed to expect, understand how it works, and they, they, they come up with mental models of, of how this works that's actually inconsistent with what they saw. But if you tell them first, say, okay, I want you to predict how it's going to work, now I'm going to show you the animation, they learn more. So there's something, so you, I think you need to, to, you know, what this task does is it makes students externalize what they believe, what they understand, what they think, and then get feedback from either the real world or the model or the virtual environment. I think this is a powerful um, Okay, so um, so in conclusion, then um, I think um, you know, in terms of fostering or educating spatial thinking, current approaches um, involve, typically involve either selecting students who are high spatial or training specific spatial skills. And I think you know what I believe is that before we train 
spatial skills. We really need to look at the, you know, what we're, you know, the domain we're looking, we want to train them for, whether it's math or chemistry or whatever, and, and really look at how spatial thinking happens in those domains. And then, you know, and I think that colla involves collaboration between people like me, cognitive or learning scientists, and, you know, actual scientists or practitioners, teachers, you know, so I think that that's really critical. And, and as I say, two promising interventions that resulted from that, that approach were this teaching multiple strategies thing and using external representations as feedback. So in summary then, spatial thinking is more than spatial, what spatial ability tests measure. Spatial thinking involves an interplay between internal and external visual representations or visualizations and also between visualization and analytic thinking. And I believe that education for spatial thinking needs to be grounded in a broad understanding of the nature of how people actually think spatially. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>